Welcome. Welcome to the Bureau of Consumer Financial Protection's Advisory Committee Roundtable. My name is Ixta Martinez. I serve as Associate Director for the External Affairs Division at the Bureau. Today's meeting is being held at the Bureau's headquarters in Washington, D.C., and is being live streamed at consumerfinance.gov. A recording of the roundtable will be made available on the Bureau's website. You can also follow the Bureau on social media, on Facebook and Twitter. In a few moments, I'll introduce Anthony Welcher, who will kick off the meeting by introducing Brian Johnson, the Bureau's Acting Deputy Director, who will provide remarks. But first, I'd like to welcome our new advisory board and council members and introduce the individuals who are serving on the Bureau's Consumer Advisory Board, or CAB, the Community Bank Advisory Council, or CBAC, and the Credit Union Advisory Council, or QAC, during the fiscal year 2019 cycle. Members, when I call your name, please raise your hand. On our Consumer Advisory Board, the CAB Chair is Dr. Ronald Johnson. Dr. Johnson is the President of Clark Atlanta University in Atlanta, Georgia. Liz Coyle is the Executive Director of Georgia Watch in Atlanta, Georgia. Sammy Elamabui is the Chief Executive Officer of Scratch Services in San Francisco, California. Manning Field is the Chief Operating Officer of Acorns in Irvine, California. Jason Gross is the Chief Executive Officer of Petal in New York, New York. Clinton Gwynn is the President and CEO of Pathway Lending in Nashville, Tennessee. Brent Neiser is the Senior Director of Strategic Programs and Alliances at the National Endowment for Financial Education in Denver, Colorado. Sophie Rosman is the Director of Product for Brightside of San Francisco, California. Luz Urritia is the Chief Executive Officer of Opportunity Fund in San Jose, California. On our Community Bank Advisory Council, the CBAC Chair is Maureen Bush. She is the Vice President of Compliance and CRA Officer of the Bank of Tampa in Tampa, Florida. John Eric Began is the founder, CEO, and president of Austin Capital Bank in Austin, Texas. Brian Bruns is the president and CEO of Lake Central Bank in Annandale, Minnesota. Michael Head is the president, CEO, and director of First Federal Savings Bank in Evansville, Indiana. Aubrey Hulins is the Vice President and Operations Manager for the Farmers National Bank of Emlinton in Emlinton, Pennsylvania. Heidi Sexton is the Executive Vice President and Chief Compliance and Risk Officer of Sound Community Bank in Seattle, Washington. Jeannie Stahl is the Senior Vice President and Chief Risk and Compliance Officer of MetaBank in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. On our Credit Union Advisory Council, the QAC Chair is Eric Rick Schmid. He is President and CEO of Star Credit Union in Las Vegas, Nevada. Arlene Babwa is Vice President of Risk Management at Coastal Federal Credit Union in Raleigh, North Carolina. Sean Cahill is the President and CEO of Southwest 66 Credit Union in Odessa, Texas. Christopher Court is Vice President of Accounting and Operations at Service First Credit Union in Danville, Pennsylvania. Teresa Hollick Campbell is President and CEO of San Diego County Credit Union in San Diego, California. James Hunsinger is Chief Risk Officer of Michigan State University Federal Credit Union in East Lansing, Michigan. Brian Price is the President and CEO of Indiana University Credit Union in Bloomington, Indiana. We also have with us Matt Cameron, Acting Staff Director for the Office of Advisory Board and Councils. I'm now pleased to introduce Anthony Welcher, 
Prior to joining the Bureau as Policy Associate Director for External Affairs, he co-founded several firms that engage in business investment strategies in the U.S. and across the globe. Anthony previously served as a presidential appointee as Director of Intergovernmental Affairs at the State Department and as Director of External and Congressional Affairs at the Export-Import Bank. Anthony has also served as a Senate aide in the Washington State Legislature. Anthony? Thank you. Thank you. Well, glad everyone is here today. Thank you again for coming. We're going to be looking forward to a very productive discussion on fintech issues. I want to again thank each of our members who are serving here for the first time, with the exception of one who's returning. So thank you, Brent, for doing that. And thank you to our three chairs who have graciously volunteered to help coordinate the conversation this year. So today begins the first series of uh, what will be the first in a series of meetings of our new advisory committees. And the purpose of this is that the committees will be providing counsel and invite, advice to the Bureau going forward on various consumer financial issues and emerging market trends related to financial technology. For the purposes of our audience who watching here on the live stream, following the Acting Deputy Director Brian Johnson's remarks next, our CAB Chair Dr. Ronald Johnson will conduct the meeting. Chair Johnson will introduce Bureau subject matter experts for discussion on credit invisibles and alternative data, and after that he will introduce Bureau subject matter experts for discussion on utilizing technology to prevent and respond to elder financial abuse. We plan for the meeting to end roughly at 4 p.m. As background, the Bureau established its advisory committees to provide substantive information, analysis, operational expertise, knowledge of their communities, and feedback to inform the Bureau's work. As a reminder here for today, the views of our advisory committee members are their views. We do expect a robust dialogue and discussion, so when things are stated, they aren't necessarily a reflection of the Bureau, they're that of the individuals speaking. So we do appreciate anything and everything that they say, but just to emphasize for those watching online or for the media, they are not necessarily our views at the Bureau itself. The acting director will hopefully be here in just an hour or so. He unfortunately was called away for another meeting that he could not miss. And once he arrives, he will also have some remarks for the audience. This year, the committees will be focused on our key issues of financial technology, or as we call it, FinTech. This direction has helped shape today's meeting's agenda. However, fin FinTech policy issues won't be the only type of feedback we will receive from our advisory committee members during their term. And in fact, uh, already in some of our meetings this morning, we've heard some very interesting alternative feedback that we weren't anticipating, and it's welcome and greatly appreciated. We plan to engage regularly with these committees throughout the year on a broad range of important issues affecting consumers across the country and in their communities. I'd now like to introduce our Acting Deputy Director, Brian Johnson, who will kick off the meeting. Welcome, everyone. Um, good to see you again. Uh, we've already had good uh, conversations already. I'm uh, very excited for what this afternoon holds. Um, Anthony, thanks for the introduction. Um, my name is Brian Johnson. I'm the Principal Policy Director at the Bureau. I'm also serving in an acting capacity uh, as Deputy. Um, Anthony also mentioned Acting Director Mulvaney uh, was here earlier. Uh, he had to step out. We expect him to rejoin us for this afternoon's discussion. Um, in the meantime, he's given me the honor of kicking off our roundtable. Um, we're thrilled to have all of our new advisory members here today. I applaud you for taking on this uh, important mission, uh, important to us. Um, you're each leaders in your communities. You bring uh, to today's discussion and to this year's conversation expertise in consumer advocacy, civil rights, education, fintech, banking, and community development. Many of you have flown in from around uh, the country, so we thank you for your willingness to serve and for sharing your time with us today. The purpose of, this, of today's event is to hear from each of you, uh, our advisory committee members. I'm excited that we had uh, such interest in uh, joining our advisory boards and committees this year, and um, we were thrilled to review applications and now thrilled to meet each of you uh, in person. Um, we need your feedback. We need to hear about the challenges uh, you face in reaching the underserved in your communities. We need to hear about the challenges you face in serving your customers and in serving your members. 
uh, we want to hear your ideas. After all, you're on the front lines in your hometowns and on main streets, um, and we are honored and privileged to uh, hear your wisdom here today and throughout the course of the next year. When we hear your perspectives, it helps us figure out what we should be doing and how we can be doing it better. So uh, today's uh, marks the beginning of what I know will be a very fruitful uh, year-long discussion. I would like to recognize the three members um, who accepted the Bureau's offer to serve as chair of their respective advisory committees uh, for the following year. Dr. Ronald Johnson is the chair of our Consumer Advisory Board. Rick Schmidt is the chair of our Con Credit Union Advisory Council. Maureen Bush is the chair of our uh, Community Bank Advisory Council. Thanks to each of you for your commitment and dedication to steer these important committees. With that, I'd like to turn uh, turn it back over to Dr. Johnson and to Matt, who can help guide us through this afternoon's conversation. Thank you. Good afternoon and uh, welcome. I want to thank um, Deputy Director Johnson. Uh, it is great for for us to gather today in Washington at the uh, at the bureau's headquarters uh, for an important set of discussions uh, in this roundtable. I'm pleased to be joined by my colleagues from the Consumer Advisory Board, CAB, uh, the Community Bank Advisory Council, CBAC, and um, the, Consumer, the Credit Union Advisory Council, CUAC. And in particular, I'd like to thank uh, the CBAC Chair, Maureen Bush, and um, the C CUAC Chair, uh, Rick Smith, uh, for their leadership on their respective advisory committees. <clears throat> Today's meeting focuses on some very important topics. Uh, these topics include invisibles, credit invisibles, alternative data, and elder financial abuse. As chair of the CIB, I've been asked by the Bureau to help moderate this afternoon's discussion. So let's begin with our first session, Credit Invisibles and Alternative Data, Opportunities to Improve Credit Profile. Uh, we are joined by a number of um, uh, subject matter experts from the Bureau. Uh, first, Daniel Dodd Ramirez, who is the Assistant Director for the Office of Community Affairs, is with us. Uh, we also have Albert Chang, who is the Counsel for the Office of Innovation. We are also joined by Bobby Connor, who is the Senior Counsel for the Office of Fair Lending. And last but not least, Kenneth Brevort, who is the Section Chief uh, for Credit Information and Policy for the Office of Research. Thank you all for joining us today, and I'll turn it over to our subject matter experts uh, to begin the discussion. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I, again, am Ken Brevort. Uh, I'm in the Office of Research here at the Bureau, and I'm going to kick things off this afternoon by talking a little bit about the research initiative that we've undertaken in the Office of Research to better understand the characteristics of people who are credit invisible, meaning that they do not have a credit record at one of the major nationwide credit reporting agencies. Uh, and the, in terms of the number of those uh, individuals, the characteristics, and a bit more about the challenges they face. Um, to date, we, we've done a series of three reports that I'll summarize very briefly. Um, the first uh, came out, I think, about four years ago now, which is called simply uh, Credit Invisibles. And in that case, what we were trying to do is develop a better picture of the characteristics of these people. You'll hear a lot of numbers thrown about about how many credit invisibles are out there, how many any individual source of alternative data might allow to become scorable, uh, and therefore sort of gain entryway in the traditional uh, credit granting process. Um, and we wanted to understand a lot more about their characteristics in terms of, you know, or do they tend to be overwhelming the minority? Yes, they do. Uh, in, by, in terms of income, they tend to be predominantly lower income. And somewhat importantly for what I'm going to talk about a little bit today is they also tend to be disproportionately young. Uh, in particular, 40% of the uh, 26 million Americans who are credit invisible are under the age of 25. Um, and the second report that we did then wanted to take a look at sort of how people make the transition out of credit invisibility. A lot of people, when they talk about credit invisibility, and I'll, I'll sort of throw myself under the bus and say I was in this boat for a long period of time, tended to talk about credit invisibility as a catch-22. Right. You had a block of people who were outside of the mainstream credit reporting system. So when they went to apply for credit, they were denied because they did not have a credit history. They therefore weren't given any loans and therefore could not establish a credit history. 
But when you step back and look at the numbers of, of people who are credit invisible, one of the things that you notice is that the incidence of credit invisibility amongst people in their late 20s, 25 to 29 years of age, is only about 9%. Now, most everybody when they turn 18 does not have a credit record. There'll be a small number of people who do. So when you think about it in that perspective, 90% of people, roughly, will be able to make the transition from being credit invisible to having a credit record by the time they're 25 or in their late 20s. And so what we wanted to do in the second report is try to figure out or develop a better picture of how people are able to make this transition, right? Why isn't this a catch-22? Are these people relying on co-borrowers? Um, are there certain types of products that may give you more ready access to the system, right? Do you get access to the system more readily through student loans, which generally aren't underwritten and don't need a credit history? Um, the answer to that study was somewhat surprising to us in that the gateway to credit visibility seemed to be for most people, including those people who are younger than 25, was overwhelmingly credit cards. Uh, and not only credit cards, but it was credit cards that these individuals were opening up in their own name. They didn't have co-borrowers. They weren't being added as authorized users, for example, on a parent's account. In the third study that we released earlier this month, we then wanted to look at this information a little bit more. And particularly, we wanted to focus on the people who were persistently credit invisible. Right? Again, if you've got that under 25 population, 90% of these people are going to be fine, and they're going to make this transition fairly readily. But for the other roughly 10% or so, they tend to be persistently credit invisible. And we wanted to use geography to learn a little bit more about where these people were located in hopes that that might give us a better picture of the challenges they face. And one of the things that we started out by looking at was sort of the rural and urban divide. Um, we were interested in geography, uh, both because it's been a long-standing concern to regulators interested in access to credit, going back at least as far as, as early concerns about redlining, uh, but also because a lot more in policy discussions, you hear a lot more people mentioning the idea of credit deserts, right? This idea that there are areas that just don't have a lot of access to credit, and in terms of credit invisibility, if you happen to grow up in one of these areas, if you turn 18 and you live in a credit desert, that may cause you to wind up being credit invisible. And so what we wanted to do is see to what extent there are people who seem to be living in areas where they're having trouble making this transition in a way that uh, individuals in other areas aren't. And what we found is that people who live in low to moderate income neighborhoods in urban areas and people who live in low to moderate income areas of rural or low to moderate income census tracts of urban areas tended to have the highest incidences of credit invisibility amongst people 25 years old or older. But there was a substantial difference in terms of what happened at higher income levels in those two areas. In particular, in urban areas, if you were then in a, if you then looked at the incidence of credit invisibility in middle income areas or upper income areas, you saw that the incidence of credit invisibility drop substantially. <clears throat> In rural areas, you see no such thing. There is a small drop, but it remains really, really elevated, which is fairly striking. So it seems to be that there are pockets of credit invisibility, and they seem to be disproportionately located in urban areas and in low-income communities of urban areas. Uh, sorry, not sure if I said that right. Or, yeah, anyhow, <laughs> hopefully you get the message. Um, we then looked at how people were making the transition differently particularly the people who made the transition successfully by 25, and particularly focusing again, knowing that it was credit cards that were the engine of this transition, how this pattern differed. And what we found is somewhat surprisingly, again, the people who made this transition tended to be overwhelmingly using credit cards more in the higher income areas of urban areas. They were much less likely to use credit cards across the board uh, in rural areas as a transition mechanism, and they were much less likely to use credit cards as a way of transitioning out of credit invisibility in low-income uh, urban communities. So there seemed to be this really tight connection, again, between the use of credit cards across geographies and the incidence of credit invisibility, which is really sort of surprising on some level, because when you think about how credit cards are marketed, how they are applied for, how they're underwritten, they're not a very high-touch business, right? You get you get solicitations in the mail, you can apply over the phone, you can see advertisements on TV, you can apply online. It's not like you have to walk into a bank and have a local financial service provider who you have to uh, receive credit from. But there are other reasons to believe that there may be a connection between banking services um, and credit cards, and that this may be manifesting itself in rural communities that may not have the same access to traditional financial depository institutions uh, or in lower income communities. Um, and so what we wanted to do is we wanted to look at sort of the relationship between where a person lived in terms of how far away their banking institution was uh, and then how far it was not. Uh, because, again, there was this relationship. The FDIC, uh, for example, they do a study or a, a survey of people who are unbanked. And one of the things that they have found is that if you do not have a checking and savings account, there's only about a 7% chance that you have 
a credit card. Uh, on the other hand, if you have a checking or savings account, about 60% of people, I think almost, um, have a, a, a credit card. So there does seem to be potentially a relationship there. So we looked at the data about the incidence of credit invisibility and how far away your nearest financial depository institution was. And we found almost no relationship. It just didn't seem to make much of a difference at all. Um, and that may also, again, not be surprising, because if you go back to the FDIC study, they asked people about sort of why, who are unbanked, why are you unbanked, what are the factors that lead to that, and very few of them said an inconvenient location was important. I think about 9% of the people gave that as one of the reasons why they didn't have a checking or savings account. Much more common were things like, we don't, I don't have enough money, or I have a distrust of banks. And so it could be not so much in these communities that you have a population that doesn't have ready access in terms of can they walk to a nearby branch or do they have, can they get there very easily. But perhaps there are institutions there that aren't necessarily offering a product mix that these consumers are, are taking advantage of. The other thing we wanted to look at was the possibility that a lot of this could be digitally driven. Um, and so we got data from the FCC at a census tract level on the percentage of households that had access to high-speed internet. And there we found a really stark relationship in terms of the incidence of credit and visibility and the likelihood that you have access to high-speed internet. Um, and it held for rural areas, urban areas, and so on, so that in those communities where you have less uh, high-speed access, you tend to have a much higher incidence of credit and visibility, suggesting that, again, some of the access questions may not necessarily be, is there a bank nearby, but how are you able to interact with those banks? What sorts of products are, are they making available to you? Good afternoon, everyone. And, and a nod to Hispanic Heritage um, Month. Uh, buenas tardes. Uh, my name is Daniel Dodd Ramirez. I'm with the Consumer Education and Engagement Division of the Bureau. And um, I'm one of um, my, the office that I represent, the Office of Community Affairs, is one of four special offices or sections within the Bureau that focus on special populations. There's also an office that focuses on, on uh, and my office focuses on lower income and economically vulnerable, the traditionally underserved. There's also an office that focuses on service members, another one that focuses on older Americans, who you'll be hearing um, from afterwards. And then there's a section that focuses on students. Um, so you can imagine um, Ken's research was very interesting to us. Um, uh, my, my background, I ran a poverty reduction initiative in Savannah, Georgia um, for almost 10 years. And I really believe that innovation happens at the local level. And we were very interested in looking at how to use the data um, that had been developed here and to turn it around into profiles for communities around the country. And so we developed around 75 profiles. Um, and so um, they kind of look like this. I know you've got some of them in your binders as well. Uh, they're one-page summaries um, that basically show the numbers of credit invisibles um, in, 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 the, in the state. Um, we've also developed some for some cities around the country as well. In total, around 70, close to 80 uh, profiles have been developed so far. Um, and really, it was really our, our intent to help um, provide this data uh, at the local level that communities could then act on. Um, one example that we've heard recently is um, Boston actually took the profile that we developed and they launched a campaign um, called Boston Builds Credit, where they're looking at reducing um, um, people, um, actually moving people to 25,000 people that are subprime to prime by 2025. Uh, so th these sorts of initiatives we think can be really addressed at, at the local level and we're very anxious to be able to help. Um, not only by providing um, uh, data, but also by um, you know, looking at other ways that we can that we can assist. One example is uh, uh, with education, and uh, I heard this morning um, someone had actually said it's not always high tech; it's also high touch, and we um, very much agree with that. And I know I know Brent uh, probably very much agrees with that as well. Um, education is really, you know, something that we can all get on board um, with, and um, my office um, has developed some materials, um, in particular one um, toolkit called Your Money, Your Goals that some of you may be familiar with, where we've um, developed content um, that helps people that are um, helping other individuals, whether it be getting a job, to get housing, to get transportation, to certify or recertify for public benefits. 
um, there's money that inter intersects with all those points. And so we wanted to help frontline workers that were interacting with clients to have the money conversation with clients. We know that employers are looking at um, credit scores increasingly you know, as, a, as a criteria for employment. Uh, and we know the, the cross the, the intersections with all these different things, housing and all these health care. And so we wanted to help equip uh, frontline staff to talk about um, finances with individuals. Um, to date, we've trained about 25,000 frontline staff with Your Money, Your Goals um, that are reaching, um, um, we estimate, 800,000 consumers um, through the different things that I've described. Um, some of the supplementary um, materials that we've developed um, that accompany Your Money, Your Goals, um, there's a, an example of it right here. Um, we call these um, booklets. They're smaller booklets um, that accompany the Your Money, Your Goals toolkit. And um, we've distributed about, um, they've actually, we've had about 400,000 already ordered since we put this out about a year and a half ago. I've got some examples of this here um, um, with debt getting in your way. And we've developed a special um, 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 a booklet also, which you see a mock-up on the screen in front of you that's focused on credit. Um, these are meant to you know, be used um, as you're working with clients. Uh, you can give a copy uh, of it to a client. And they've been very um, successful um, in helping p to address you know, issues uh, around credit and visibility. Um, the last thing I'll just mention real quick is that we are very interested um, in um, uh, these three um, particular areas here, uh, credit builder loans, the potential with secured credit cards, and alternative data to help build uh, a, a credit invisible consumer credit profile. Uh, we think there's a lot of potential. We've undertaken some research uh, in particular around credit builder loans that I'm happy to talk more about. Um, and we'll be looking at you know, partnering um, more closely with the Office of Innovation um, to really look at other potential areas where we can, where we can you know, you know, hopefully take more research to help build a, a case um, within you know, um, businesses uh, um, to help address credit and visibility by offering more products. Good afternoon, my name is Bobby Connor. I'm Senior Counsel in the Office of Fair Lending. First of all, I need to apologize on behalf of Patrice Ficklin, our Fair Lending Director. She unexpectedly uh, couldn't make this meeting at the last minute, so um, you're stuck with me. Second of all, I'll apologize for um, delivering her remarks, probably not as eloquently as she would, so bear with me. Before I jump uh, right into the substance of our recent symposium, I wanted to briefly share to you how, and most importantly, why we had it. And some of this um, kind of echoes on what Ken had just said. In 2015, the Bureau's Office of Research authored a data point finding that 26 million people in the United States are credit invisible. In other words, this figure indicates that one in every 10 adults does not have any credit history with one of the three credit reporting companies. As Ken noted, the report also found that black consumers, Hispanic consumers, and consumers in low-income neighborhoods are more likely to have no credit history or not enough credit history to produce a credit score. The Office of Fair Lending and Equal Opportunity has a statutory mandate to ensure fair, equitable, and non-discriminatory access to credit. So one of its primary focuses for the past few years has been illegal redlining. Redlining is an illegal practice where people living in one certain area or neighborhood are not given the same access to credit as people in other areas or neighborhoods on the basis of race, color, or for some other prohibitive reason. With this background, through close collaboration between my office, the Office of Fair Lending, and Ken's office, the Office of Research, the Bureau began to research this intersection between credit access and geography. As a part of our ongoing efforts to learn more about these important issues, recently on Monday, September 17th, the Bureau held a day-long symposium entitled Building a Bridge to Credit Visibility. The goal of the symposium was to bring together a diverse set of stakeholders, including those representing industry, academia, trade associations, government, community groups, research, policy and think tank organizations, 
all to explore challenges related to access to consumer credit and potential innovations and strategies to overcome barriers and to expand consumer credit access. Specifically, the symposium covered innovations to address barriers consumers face in accessing, accessing credit, either due to invisible credit profiles or living in a credit desert, successful models of innovative entry credit products used to establish credit, such as secured cards, credit builder products, installment loans, and possibly retail credit, micro enterprise credit products and services that promote the establishment and growth of small business enterprises, and lastly, the role alternative data and modeling techniques can play in expanding access to traditional credit. We ended the day with a fireside chat with many bureau leaders, including Paul Watkins, to discuss his new Office of Innovation and how the Bureau is prioritizing efforts on innovation. The symposium overall was a tremendous success. Going forward, the Bureau is committed to continue to serve as a convener of these important issues and to take what we've learned through these, through these symposiums and to use it to inform our work. In our next symposium, we hope to bring together the same kind of diverse perspectives to tackle the next stage in the lifestyle of credit visibility. That is, once credit is established, how can consumers and communities build wealth? What does the path of sustained credit visibility and access to prime credit actually look like for consumers? And what innovative lending models exist to help consumer, consumers generate wealth in their communities? And we hope to have this symposium sometime next year. Besides these symposiums, another tool in our efforts to prioritize innovation is the Bureau's No Action Letter policy. As you may know, under the Bureau's program, a No Action Letter signifies that Bureau staff have no present intent to recommend initiation of supervisory or enforcement action with respect to a particular statute or regulation. In September of last year, the Bureau issued its first ever no action letter to Upstart, a company that uses non-traditional or alternative data and modeling techniques in lending decision making, and that is with regarding the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, ECOA. The letter applies to Upstart's model for underwriting and pricing applicants as described in the company's application materials. Of course, that no action letter was specific to the facts and circumstances to Upstart. The Bureau is continuing to monitor Upstart regarding its compliance with the terms of the letter. And as a part of its request, Upstart agreed to conduct ongoing fair lending testing and to employ other consumer safeguards in addition to other requirements. The Bureau has been pleased overall with how the no action letter has worked in this first of its kind use. And the Office of Fair Lending looks forward to continue to work with Upstart and other applicants for no, no action letters, as well as the Office of Innovation to increase participation by companies seeking to advance new products and services. We also see potential in working with the Office of Innovation and applicants in its trial disclosure program to design innovative disclosures and ways to deliver disclosures under ECOA. As you may know, the Office of Innovation, which may be discussed later, has recently proposed revisions to its trial disclosure policy, and the Bureau encourages the public to review these and comment on the proposed policy. The comment period for this policy, the proposed policy, closes on October 10th. These are only a couple examples that the Office of Fair Lending can support the new Office of Innovation, as well as the Bureau's overall efforts to prioritize innovation and we look forward to doing so and working closely with the new Office of Innovation on these very important efforts. So with that, thank you for allowing me to speak today and I look forward to our future engagements on fair lending issues. Thanks, Bobby. Uh, Albert Chang with the uh, Office of Innovation. Uh, I know we'll want to reserve as much time as possible for the uh, advisory board members to provide input and, and uh, discuss these important issues, so I'll just uh, quickly note two things. Uh, one is that we at the agency have, uh, for some time now, been educating ourselves on the uh, uh, issue of alternative data and alternative modeling techniques like machine learning for quite some time now. Uh, these technologies are, in my view, uh, potential technical solutions, potential market solutions to the sort of greater issue of credit invisibility that 
uh, has been discussed uh, so far today. And we've been educating ourselves on these types of technologies through an internal working group here at the Bureau that is focused uh, solely on alternative data. And that working group was responsible uh, last year for a uh, request for information on uh, alternative data as well as alternative modeling techniques uh, like machine learning. Um, the RFI uh, responses are public. I, I won't uh, attempt to summarize all of them, but I would encourage uh, stakeholders who are interested in these technologies to review those comments. I know a number of the advisory board members here were instrumental in providing comments, so thank you for uh, adding to the uh, body of comments there. And I will say that those comments were certainly uh, very important for us in terms of uh, framing the issues associated with these technologies, as well as understanding the, uh, the subtleties associated with uh, using these uh, technical solutions. Uh, the second point that I'll make is that, as many of you know, uh, the Bureau recently opened a new uh, Office of Innovation, which obviously will have significant uh, interests and equities in new technologies like alternative data use and machine learning. Uh, the Office of Innovation is uh, tasked with facilitating uh, consumer-friendly innovation, which is now a key priority for the Bureau. As part of the announcement, of the Office of Innovation, Director Mulvaney also named Paul Watkins as the new head and director of the office. Paul comes to us from the Arizona Attorney General's office, and he has the distinction of having set up and managed uh, a fintech regulatory sandbox in Arizona, the first of its kind uh, at the state level, arguably the uh, first of its kind at, at any level in the U.S. So we welcome uh, Paul. Paul has started uh, staffing up the office, which is why I have uh, my Office of Innovation tent card here. And we look forward as a team to um, uh, revising policies, creating new policies to promote innovation and competition, all uh, in furtherance of, of greater consumer choice uh, and, and access in financial services. And just as one example, as Bobby pointed out, we recently uh, issued a revised uh, trial disclosure uh, a waiver policy for comment. Uh, that comment period closes October 10th, so we're looking for your, forward to your comments on that policy. And as we pointed out in Supervisory Highlights, the most recent uh, edition of Supervisory Highlights, we're also taking a look at the no action letter policy to see what revisions can be made to encourage uh, applicants for that program. So um, without further ado, I'll hand it back over to uh, Dr. Johnson and, and Matt to continue the conversation. <clears throat> well, what I'd like to do is to begin the discussion uh, with the following question. Um, and the, the question focuses on this document, the um, lo locality-specific uh, uh, state profile. Um, I'd like to get a sense of the, um, of the board members' um, reaction to this document. And as well, uh, do you um, <clears throat> see how this can actually um, be helpful in, uh, in, in the credit information process? And so, to begin, we open up the floor. Um, I'd like to just comment, looking at the San Diego statistical metropolitan area, I was very surprised to see about 270,000 uh, between the invisibles and the credit files out of our 2.4 million residents. That was pretty enlightening. I think it's information that should be shared. I think it was really interesting that it shows access to the Internet is a really main factor. That's why programs like Lifeline are just so key for financial inclusion. When you looked at the study, did you also look at any credit that the credit invisibles were accessing, so a heat map in each of the respective regions about how many non-bank providers are in those areas or alternative lenders. Yeah, so in the study that we looked at how people make the transition out of credit invisibility, we did look at the type of credit they were using and the type of credit products uh, they were doing. In future work, I think we want to look a little bit more at sort of what that means, how the, the way that you make that transition may therefore sort of 
determine how you progress from there. Because, for example, in lower income communities, one of the things we found is that a lot of the people who established a credit record for the first time did so by a collection accounts uh, and other sort of delinquent payments. That it's going to sort of change how you're. Yes, you're in the system. Yes, you're visible. But you're then viewed in a much you know, worse light than you would have been otherwise. Um, in terms of the geographic profiles like this, we haven't really done that sort of analysis at, at that fine of a geographic area yet. Sorry, I have a question about the high-speed internet access. Does that, does that also include uh, smartphone ownership? So the data we used there was from the FCC, which just defines sort of a, a broadband as a particular speed. Um, and it didn't really talk about how you were accessing that, if you were doing it via a mobile phone or a home connection. So you know, that was the data we had to do the analysis, and so that's what we've worked with so far. But in the future, we're hoping to do more. Uh, Brian Price, Indiana University Credit Union. Certainly the data uh, at about 20% of the, of the folks in our community uh, have an issue with credit. To be honest with you, the, the problem we have in Monroe County is the United Way reports 22% of all residents don't have an active banking account, period. So I think one of the real challenges in our community is uh, trying to bring those folks in to establish or reestablish a depository account. We're working with United Way in that regard and the local banks as well, but it's a tremendous challenge uh, bringing folks in. I think there's a tremendous distrust of financial services. Uh, I think there's um, a real cash community out there that would just rather not interact with us. Uh, I think, unfortunately, for them, it poses much greater risk for them in terms of the security of, of their assets and the like. So I think one of the things that we have got to do better uh, as an entity in financial services is to make sure there is an opportunity to have a basic savings account that can develop into a basic checking account that doesn't cost the consumer a great deal, that allows them to gain some confidence in the financial banking system. Without that, I think the prospect of developing credit uh, for a lot of these consumers is just simply not going to occur. So I would encourage the uh, uh, all of us here and those in the Bureau to consider how we might build better this opportunity to have a basic depository account. Let's face it, you're not going to get a credit card. You can't make a payment. You can't do anything without a basic banking relationship today. And we Sophie Rosman. Oh. oh, go ahead. Sophie Rosman from Brightside. I'm struck uh, there are 5 million uh, adults in my state, the state of California, who are no file or thin file. When I think about that's five million, you know, moms who, if they're out of work on medical leave for a month, maybe when they come back to work are so behind on bills, they maybe can't pay for their insulin, um, might go back out on med medical leave. That's a dad who is in trouble when he his car needs repairs, can't bridge the gap, can't make it to work, loses his job, and then his he and his kids and family are evicted. Um, it's incredibly powerful, so thank you. Um, I was struck by the, the research that you shared around persistent credit invisibility, even for those with higher incomes. I think that uh, it draws attention to one of the more exciting, promising opportunities to bridge the gap for credit invisibles. Um, using what I wouldn't call alternative data, I would call traditional data, with data about uh, ability to pay and affordability. That's income and expense data. I think we can all agree we can get rid of the term alternative for that kind of data. Um, the Bureau has an unprecedented uh, tool to support the modernization of how individuals are able to provide proof of their ability to pay, of their income, to come out of the shadows to get access to affordable credit um, through the uh, authority in Dodd-Frank under Section 1033 to, uh, that establishes the individual's rights to their own personal financial data. Uh, and the Bureau has an opportunity to facilitate that through the mandatory rulemaking sooner rather than later uh, to ensure that our system allows people to quickly, safely, and securely uh, share the information about their income and expenses that will allow them to access mainstream credit. Um, the, 
The Bureau also has an opportunity to partner with the Department of Treasury uh, on government health data, in particular tax data. Tax data is some of the most significant data that will close the gap on credit invisibility for people in all regions and all walks of life in this country. The IRS has long been in the business in giving taxpayers the right to permission banks to uh, uh, receive tax data uh, on um, the taxpayer's behalf in order to prove their uh, income and prove other financial attributes in order to access mortgage credit for the mainstream. But it's an incredibly expensive and time-consuming process now. The Department of Treasury has asked for funding to be able to expand the IRS's service and modernize it such that taxpayers can permission the IRS to share their valuable information that proves their credit worthiness with trusted third parties of their uh, choosing in a safer and more secure and modern manner. I think the Bureau can uh, uh, go a long way to support uh, the implementation of that in industry because the IRS only controls the data infrastructure and the Bureau will have responsibility for the uh, way it is actually implemented um, on the ground and, and to ensure that all the consumer protection are in place that will um, ensure that process is safe. Rick Schmidt, Westar Credit Union. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm also wondering if there's any data relative to the impact of the recession as it relates to you know, how people want to participate going forward in the uh, credit market. Because you look at, certainly Las Vegas was very hard hit, <coughs> and you look at people, you know, children who were 15, 16, 17 and saw their parents losing their cars, their homes, and losing faith in the financial services industry and choosing not to participate because they see the potential downside of what happens if I get a loan and I can't pay, and then I then I suffer from that. I also wonder, in the data that we were given, I didn't see anything relative to the performance of those consumers when they go from invisible to visible, because as we talk about uh, alternative data and machine learning, um, certainly from the bank slash credit union environment, our regulators want to support these type of initiatives, but they don't have a huge tolerance for uh, you know charge-off ratios and delinquencies and the uh, provision expense, so it would be very important to understand as people move to credit visibility, how well do they do? Is the delinquency in line with what we see for the normal population? Is it higher? Is it lower? Yeah, just to follow up, one of the interesting things about that is that there's also another group that I haven't talked about today, which is people who have a credit record, but it is not considered to be scorable by, say, the FICO model, because of exactly the concern you just raised, right? You have people who maybe have a credit record that is very thin, so there's just not a lot of information there. So, yes, you could produce a prediction of how good they're going to perform, but if that prediction is too variable, if it's too noisy, if you don't have enough faith in it, you can't really use that. So there is this group that has a credit record, but FICO generally says, unless you have a specific amount of information or some threshold of information, it's too unreliable. So there's this middle group that I think sort of deals with exactly the population you're talking about. And I think FICO has made a determination that for the people that it, that it can score, the scores are reasonably consistent with the subsequent performance. And I think it's also important, I, we tend to categorize the credit invisibles or the thin files or the stale credits as subprime. And they're not subprime. They, for those that have been lending to this population for many, many years, you see a significant difference in the credit performance. And I think that's something that the Bureau uh, should explore with, with the different uh, providers. Um, so. One of, one, of the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the points that I'd like to make to build off of Sophie's and Brian's ideas, um, from FinTech companies' perspective, I'm Manning Field from Acorns. And... You know, one of the things I think that often gets misunderstood is alternative data does not equal fintech. Um, I think it's a combination of data with the ideas that Brian had around product. But I think what, what really, um, what it comes down to is actually how do you deliver humanity? And I think one of the things that fintech really kind of delivers is really human-centered design and how you think about customer experience and how that all comes together. Because And the reason why I asked the mobile question is my hypothesis would be that you can actually reach that audience through smartphones. Um, and 
they may not want to walk into a retail store. And so the opportunity to reach them and intuitively take them through an experience that is a combination of product using alternative data and human-centered design, that that may be a way in which to actually reach this audience. I'll, uh, since this microphone is already on, um, I'll jump in with a comment as well. Uh, Jason Gross from Pedal, we're also a fintech company working on market solutions to the very problem that we're discussing. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about what we do at Pedal and what we've learned, um, kind of how we think about the different populations that are impacted. Um, so uh, the primary technology that we're bringing to market at Pedal involves the use of more of the financial record of a consumer um, in the underwriting process. Um, uh, to, to echo uh, Sophie comment, um, we don't think about this as alternative data. Um, we think about it as a more holistic underwriting process whereby we bring in bank account transaction information to the underwriting decision. Um, that makes visible, so to speak, potentially tens of millions of people that have only a DDA account or a prepaid card but have no record at the credit bureaus. Um, I think the comment that was made uh, by Brian, I believe, is, is really important that sort of the first step is getting people into a bank account um, or into some sort of bank account substitute um, for a solution like this to work. Um, but of course, we need to be able to, consumers need to be able to then share the financial record that they have developed. Um, and that's one of the reasons why, at least uh, in the Consumer Advisory Board discussions, um, Dodd-Frank, Secretary Section 1033 um, really is kind of the, 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 the topic that is top of mind for many of us as sort of the key that can unlock some of the most exciting solutions to this problem. And the last point that I would add um, is sort of um, uh, piggybacking off of uh, the point that Ken made. Um, you don't, we, this isn't a binary transition. Uh, where you move from invisible to visible, um, there's actually quite a process associated with building credit. Um, and there's a period of time by which people may be generating a credit record um, but are being uh, penalized by the uh, scoring systems that are in place for the uncertainty associated with that record. So you don't show up on the credit bureaus as a 750 uh, FICO score. You show up pretty low on the spectrum. And what that means is the products available to you um, are expensive. Um, and so, you know, while we may see uh, a lot of folks that transition from credit invisible to visible through the course of their 20s, um, the products that they're using perhaps are not appropriate for their financial position. Perhaps they're not as safe or as affordable as they could be if we were able to bring more data into the equation. Um, so those are just a few of the comments. And and, uh, you know, our experience in lending to this group, uh, albeit uh, I don't have the kind of experience that some of the folks around the table do and that we're a newer company, um, but we have seen very good credit performance out of folks that the FICO score would tell you uh, don't exist or, or, or are very high risk. Um, and so, you know, we're exposing, I think, um, uh, uh, populations that do have the financial resources to borrow credit that can afford a loan, um, but that today are, are are, are oftentimes shut out of the mainstream system. From the, uh, to tie, tie on to what you were talking about, Jason, uh, I'm Mike Head with First Federal Savings Bank in Southwest Indiana, and 50% of our business that our bank does is mortgage lending, and that's the primary thing uh, we're talking about. And it has just been, I, I think sometimes Banks may get a bad rap, or community banks may get a very bad rap uh, about just going based on credit scores. Okay, credit scores really only come into play in a main sense if you're dealing with the with the mortgage market, the secondary mortgage market. The great thing about community banks is that we have portfolios, and I, I can speak firsthand for our bank. Going back at least 20, 25 years, if we have somebody that comes to us that has a minimal credit score, okay, the first thing we sit down and ask is, first question is, do you live at home? Do you rent? Okay, if, if they live at home, well, that's almost a dead end. You know, see if mom, dad could give you a, a gift or something to get you started. But if they rent, 
we routinely use our, our utility provider as Vectrin. We use Vectrin. Vectrin has a full history of their utility payments, and they'll tell you how many times, how many times current, how many times 10, how many times 30. Do they pay your utility bill on, on time? Amazon Waterworks, they provide, at least our area banks, with a credit history of folks. And we're open-minded that we will even sit down and we've got a form letter we'll send to the tenant, or excuse me, to uh, the owner of where this person rents and say, Here, here's the information, here's the release for them to give us this information. Please provide us with their payment history. So I, I think I understand your situation, but I think the, the community banks have been very aggressive over the last 20 years in coming up with sources of alternative data to be able to help put folks in homes who are prepared and ready to be put in a home. And I, and I think that's part of the key is that not everybody at a certain age or at a certain stage of life is ready for a home. And, and the last thing we want to do is put someone in a home and set them up to fail. But, but I think you'll find the banks are very open-minded in essence creating a credit score over and above what the credit agency has. Thank you. Uh, Brent Neiser, National Endowment for Financial Education. I'm going to throw out a little wild idea based on uh, Sophie talking about API tax data. So if we can kind of think about a near-term future where the Vita sites, the community connections where low, low to moderate income people deal with the real resource of, of a tax refund, split refund potentials, EITC, linking a split refund possibility to uh, a prepaid card or some other form of that stored value that could put them on a credit pathway as well. And then I just want to mention these other unique low to moderate income goals for credit that could attract people to a credit card or credit settings and credit performance. Emergency loan and for interme uh, community intermediaries to help. Emergency loans, domestic violence victims, loans to become a citizen, housing stability loans to forego eviction, first and last month rent deposit loans, and um, assistive technology for the disabled. So these are other unique on-ramps for folks that don't follow the traditional gateway patterns. And Rick Schmidt again from Westar. Uh, to Jason's point about you know the credit performance of that portfolio, and I agree 100%, a lot of these people can and should be um, considered to be good credit risk because just because you have not had a loan doesn't mean you can't be worthy of having a loan. One of the challenges, back to my point earlier and from our conversations this morning, is that from, and I can only speak from the credit union perspective, is, and this is probably something for the Bureau to, to take on, is what do these state and federal regulators, what is their appetite to accept alternative types of data for underwriting? Um, I mentioned earlier, you know, Fannie Mae as it relates to the secondary market for real estate lending, but when you look at uh, credit cards or auto loans and things of that nature, um, you know, our regulators are by, by nature conservative and they're looking to protect the share insurance fund. And I, I know of examples where credit unions have tried to use alternative data to score people, to look at things like Mike discussed, um, and have been told you are not being prudent, you're not operating safely and soundly. So part of the equation as it relates from the credit union perspective is the regulars have to go hand in hand because if they're not on board, they're going to prevent us from looking at some of the alternative means of bringing some of those people into the market. It's not that we don't want to, it's in many cases we're going to be prevented by our regulators, and I think that's where the Bureau can do an important job of bringing not just FDIC and NCUA on board, but for those of us who are state chartered, you've got to deal with the financial institutions division and the directors and commissioners at the state level because they're the ones that actually drive our regulatory environment. Jim Hunsanger from MSU Federal Credit Union. <clears throat> I just want to tag into something that Jason said regarding uh, alternative data and just highlight. Um, that uh, credit unions, and I can speak for uh, our industry as well, um, use 
transaction data uh, to help underwrite loans when there is thin credit or no credit files as well. And I think the, the key there is that, that they've opened an account and have provided access to a checking or savings account. And I think Brian highlighted earlier uh, the uh, um, likelihood that an individual would have credit if they have a checking or savings account uh, increases significantly uh, if that's the case. And so m maybe just to encourage the Bureau as you're doing research in that area or publishing educational materials uh, that uh, um, looking in, in the book that you handed out, there doesn't seem to be a lot of information about the benefits of having a checking or savings account, but also focusing and uh, including that uh, as part of the educational materials for credit and how important that is in order to get access to credit. I'll just um, quickly mention um, the toolkit, which which is Your Money, Your Goals, is about 250 pages, and there is a whole section just on choosing the right financial product that addresses um, bank and credit credit union accounts. This is just uh, one supplementary um, um, you know item that accompanies the toolkit. I just want to touch on something that, that Mike and, and Sophie were talking a little bit about, and this is Sean Cahill from Southwest 66 Credit Union in Odessa, Texas. Uh, two years ago, we partnered with the, the uh, Feline and Ford Foundation, and as we think about innovation, to come up with what we call a borrow and save product. And this is really to help uh, move from credit invisible to the credit visible. And we use ability to repay, and that's the, the main focus of that. You don't need a, a FICO score in order to be able to get that. Um, with that, we do... Um, some real good, strong financial education, some budgeting at the beginning of that. Uh, we actually take 25% of that loan and put that into a savings account. So not only are we getting folks into the credit realm, we're also creating strong savings behaviors. So the next time something happens, they don't maybe need to get a loan. They can go towards their, their savings. Um, it's been a wonderful program. And as people move through that, they get higher levels of credit, get a credit card from that. Uh, we've seen less than 30 basis points of default on that. So it's a really, when you think about uh, the risk involved with the credit invisible, if you do the right things up front, if you use the right metrics, whether it's alternative data, uh, ability to repay, and then do some of that financial literacy and uh, uh, budgeting, you can have a really strong program and, uh, and innovate and move folks from the, the shadows into the mainstream. So I know that, um, just a kind of a, a quick follow-up, um, I know that financial technology is one of the main themes of the gathering here today. Um, and I think that, you know, as we're thinking about the different sorts of very interesting market practices that exist for serving this population, where technology can enter the equation is really when it comes to the cost associated with serving these customers. Um, as well as kind of new means uh, to do so. But if you think about the mortgage market, uh, for instance, um, that Michael mentioned, you know, the average cost to underwrite a mortgage in the United States is over $8,000. Um, many of the products that we're talking about to serve folks who are just entering the system are not mortgage products or commercial loans. Um, we're talking about essentially small dollar lending products, primarily credit cards. You see some activity in auto and other small dollar personal loan products where the business model simply will not support an $8,000 underwriting process or a process that takes weeks of exchanging paperwork, etc. Um, and so Th there is the opportunity where technology can enter the equation to uh, reduce the cost to service these populations. And I think that's really the key or one of the keys to expanding access. Um, you know, some of the technology that folks in the fintech community are developing, you know, allows you to take an underwriting process that looks at the full financial record of a consumer and reduce the cost from hundreds or thousands of dollars per decision to, you know, a couple of bucks. Um, and that makes a really big difference in your cost structure and your ability to get these products into the hands of folks that, um, that need them. Eric Begwin, Austin Capital Bank. Uh, my institution is very heavily involved in this area, uh, both in alternative data and in credit building. Uh, we, we did a, a pilot credit builder account that, that we eliminated many of the upfront barriers for uh, and the bank designed that product. 
and in, in 12 months we were able to uh, open 40,000 accounts nationwide. Um, the, the average consumer there uh, went from no score to about mid-600s six, mid, uh, in, in under six months. Uh, or we could take somebody with a, a thin file and, and move them up 40 or 60 points in about the same time frame. Really, so when we talk to these consumers about, you know, why did they come to our door, uh, what we really found is that consumers didn't know about the need for credit. Um, they, they really didn't understand the benefit to it or the cost of not having it. And, and what the catalyst was is that they either signed up for one of the data, data aggregator sites where they, they got a free score, which maybe is not indicative of FICO score, but is, is at least indicative of credit profile direction, um, or they were denied for credit. And, and one of those two catalysts led them to do a search on the internet and say, how do I build my credit? How do I establish credit? How do I rebuild my credit? Um, so really focusing on, on uh, how do we make the, the consumers in need here, the invisibles, the thin files, aware of you know, investing in your credit literally might be the best investment you ever make in your life. And, and we've run the math on, on our product that we, that we piloted, and the return on investment was somewhere between 1,200% and 30,000% for the consumer. It literally is the best investment they'll ever make. I have a comment on um, education and content, and I commend uh, the Bureau on the progress and all of the work they've done. Um, but our responsibility on the CAB, at least, is to give advice and feedback. And um, as commendable as, as a 250-page document is, so that's a toolkit, um, that is actually the problem. Um, and so I think when you come to think about the consumer experience, design, building confidence, building trust, um, you have to work really, really hard and think about that from a human-centered way. Um, it's something we do at our company, but I think it's something that technology can help people on a kind of an education journey. So it's not necessarily just about producing the content, but it's about the experience and the context in which you present that content. Um, this might be in the study, but to understand the magnitude of the problem and the costs that it means to be a credit invisible, I think it's important to highlight. Um, I know this includes consumers primarily, but the small business borrowers at the bottom of the pyramid, they are consumers too. And day in and day out, um, we see how merchant cash advances and other products are having very destructive consequences in the lives of, of the businesses and the individuals and their families. And so the ability to show a comparison of the costs of what it costs to not have a credit score or via credit invisible versus what other responsible providers can offer, I think would bring even more light to the subject. I just want to add, um, in addition to the, um, the discussion about alternative uh, data, um, what other complementary activities should be included? Uh, so far, um, there has been a, um, a mention of um, the importance of trust, because if the people uh, don't trust the system, they're not going to actually engage it. Uh, Samath earlier talked about the need for uh, competition. I'd like for him to, to just to talk a little bit more about that in terms of service providers behind the loans. Uh, so it's not just alternative information, but there are all these other ancillary but very, very important elements. Uh, thank you, Ron. This is Samuel O'Malley from Scratch. Uh, I think the interesting thing, we're all talking about, you know, the ability to get credit, and there has been strides that have made over the years. But that's just the first few minutes of what might be the lifetime of a 20 or 30 year loan, as like Michael put it, kind of in the mortgage. And once you shift to that repayment period, which we also know here as loan servicing, unfortunately there, there hasn't been much innovation or technology or competition uh, for decades. Uh, and it stems from the fact that the borrower has no choice in who their servicer is. There is no institutional incentive whatsoever to compete or to improve or treat that individual with any fairness. And in that case, there is no trust built, which then stems to the real problem then later of even those folks trusting those institutions or where they get credit as well. Uh, it's really important to start putting those institutional incentives, if not at least a start of fiduciary responsibility to those borrowers. You know, you look at how much protections or fiduciary responsibilities exist in the people who do have equities, how few they are. Uh, but, you know, getting your debt serviced or managed is ubiquitous. Everyone has debt, but there's no fiduciary responsibility there. There is no choice. It's the only industry where you don't get to choose who your provider is. 
and so it's not that the system today doesn't, you know, uh, allow for that. At the end of the day, the borrower is paying for their debt to be serviced. It's baked into the interest rate. Uh, you can pull it out, hand it back to the borrower, let them choose. And it's not that mobility doesn't exist either in the infrastructure. You know, the, there's a concept of a servicing right. Borrowers get yanked around all the time from one provider to the another. It's just that they don't have the right to actually choose that. And I think until we really look at, you know, what the effects of repayment is on the credit invisibilities and all people who have debt, I, I think there's a lot of strides to be made then. Uh, I'd like to jump in on that. Go ahead. Um, I, I'd, I'd like uh, to build on, I think it was John's comment, not wearing my glasses, uh, uh, about the fact that uh, one's credit worthiness or proof of one's credit worthiness is an asset. And, uh, and also on Sammy's comments about um, the responsibilities that uh, servicers uh, have to borrowers. Um, if, if we step back and we, th we think uh, about the size of, th of the asset management industry and the way the asset management industry works and we compare it to how the options that individuals in this country have for managing their own credit worthiness as an asset or for managing their liabilities, it's night and day. We, uh, the, the Bureau, uh, I think, has a ter tremendous opportunity to nurture the emergence of a sector in our financial services system that is focused on liability management, that is uh, taking some of the best of what um, we've learned in other analogous sectors, like the concept of fiduciary responsibility, um, and uh, and allowing people to use the latest technology to have agents that act on their behalf through software, through uh, human agents, through a combination of the two, to help optimize their financial life. It sounds science fiction-y, but we live in a world where we went from having paper maps to Google Maps to self-driving cars in the matter of a short amount of time. And that kind of step change can occur when we have the technology infrastructure in place that allows the uh, latent capacity for innovation of this economy uh, to work on the problem to create new and innovative solutions. And part of that infrastructure is data. Just as with the advent of digital maps and the uh, evolution towards self-driving cars, uh, the uh, evolution from paper financial records to a world in which individuals have strong rights to digital uh, versions of their financial records that they can share with third parties of their choosing will be the foundation on which a liability management industry can emerge, uh, one that is populated by uh, entrepreneurs and for-profit companies, but also independent, not-for-profit intermediaries like advocacy groups and, and financial educators. Sammy, could you, could you, I guess for a point of education, kind of elaborate uh, I, I guess the need of what you were talking about, because I, I find it very interesting and I need some education because we're not talking to city banks, you're talking to community banks, okay? And as a community bank, like I said, we do 50% of our limit, limit uh, no, lending is retail oriented, okay? Of the thousands of mortgage loans that we have on our books, literally 99.9%, and the only ones we do not service are FHA, VA, because they're government programs, okay? How we service a loan has a dramatic effect on our customer relationship. And the thing, the most important thing to a community bank is dealing, as we've talked about earlier, we see our customers in the grocery store, at school, we see them everywhere. And it is our job to take care of our customers because if we don't, the grapevine is very quick, okay? And a bad reputation can go, just can go through a bank very fast. 
So, so I guess I need to, it's not within my mindset at this time to understand, you know, how, how would a financial institution not want to take care of a person? I just need some education. So I'm referring to the state of loan servicing today, and I'm sure the Bureau is very familiar with it, given the numerous enforcement actions that's also brought upon participants in the loan servicing industry. Uh, I think we see this kind of in practice every day. So I'm not referring to any one particular community bank as much as the large kind of servicers that do end up servicing most of debt, whether it's student debt or mortgage debt and a variety of other debts. Uh, I, I think the key point that I, I'm trying to also bring is, unfortunately, when you, and I, I was curious to not per se see this in the research, when you take a look at uh, an individual from a certain higher socioeconomic class, you know, or even a corporation, you know, they're able to manage debt to their advantage. But unfortunately, the average individual is not able to manage it, to, unfortunately, to their detriment. Uh, it, it's, it's, again, a great effort to try to create those 250 pages to try to kind of bridge that gap. But that gap shouldn't exist. There should be a way to truly democratize that in a way where you're enabling it right into the financial instrument or the service provider that's responsible for doing that. Um, I wanted to comment, Arlene Babble from Coastal Federal in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, is there any thought or has this been looked at? We are assuming that no credit or thin file is, um, is not by design. Do you know how many, <clears throat> how many folks of the numbers that you've generated here don't want to have credit? Um, we've gone through several iterations in a financial landscape where in my day, building your credit, you borrow and so you can build your credit. What we're seeing in North Carolina, where we have a lot of universities, um, they don't want to build credit by borrowing money. And I think the steps that you take in your community um, are kind of cut and dried, but it, it, takes, um, it takes out of the equation the need for financial institutions to adapt to whatever is going on in our financial landscape. If a member does not want to borrow money, how can we use the alternative data to meet them where they are so we can be um, more member friendly? Um, I think here, what we hear a lot from millennials will tell them, you know, um, build your credit by borrowing. So when you want to buy a house, well, they don't want to buy a house. They want to remain footloose, fancy free, and, and just rent for the whole rest of their lives, or at least until they're 50, um, when they think they should settle down, <laughs> which is middle age. So these recommendations, while good, and I think um, they're useful as well, it takes out the creativity that I think we need to um, be in that space to become more nimble, to adjust to what's happening out there in our marketplace. Yeah, I, I agree. This is Jeannie Stahl again. I'm Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And by the way, in South Dakota, they're very conservative and many people do not want loans of any sort. Like that, That's part of their values. But that being said, I just wanted to build on something Brent said. Um, I feel like in the banking industry, and, and maybe it's through evolution or even through how regulations are made, we look at people in pieces. We look at people, deposits are over here, and loans are over here, and maybe a lockbox over here, but there really isn't a holistic view, or even a evolution plan, right, of finding ways that will entice someone in the door. It may not be credit. It may be checking. It may be uh, reloadable cards. It may be a tax refund. And then figuring out kind of at that next evolution, what are they interested in, picture, putting it together for them holistically. It's really hard as a consumer, even myself, to get a good financial picture, um, even at one financial institution. You know, I don't know how realistic it is to put all the pieces together across financial institutions, but for our own. And so I actually think that's a really good point if we're, we're wanting to assist customers in serving them and not just through lending, but through products to figure out ways to bring a more holistic product set to them that work that evolves over their lifetimes. I'd like to go back to something Jason said a second ago about the speed and the cost efficiencies of using technology for the underwriting. And I want to kind of frame it in a different way that I think that marrying technology and the financial services industry in this scenario is almost um, 
inevitable. It has to happen because I'm thinking in terms of when you look at alternative credit or alternative data and you say, how do I evaluate a bank statement versus a rental agreement versus a utility bill? And how many months is worth this or worth that? And how do I assign a risk to that? So doing that on a manual level becomes almost impossible. First of all, it's going to be far too time consuming for any financial institution to assign staff to underwrite what might take hours to underwrite an individual loan for a $500 credit card. It will not be cost effective. So technology becomes absolutely critical in this process. Again, I come back to the Bureau's role in all of this in terms of trying to create a, first of all, a pathway, but also the rules to say what avoids disparate treatment, disparate impact. Because if I look and I say, I'm going to assign X weight to a bank statement because they have a certain amount of checking history, a certain type of checking history, but then I look at that history, and I come from Las Vegas, so we see some interesting things on people's checking history, and, and you assign a certain weight to where they're spending their money or how they're spending the money. We see lots of people that will get paid at 9 o'clock in the morning, and will be at a casino, and will have spent all of that money by 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and then be back to us the next day for a, for a PAL loan. So how do you assign a risk to someone like that in a way that does not create disparate treatment, disparate impact, and that you are treating everybody evenly and fairly? And I think that's where the Bureau has an important role in this process. But I think absolutely technology becomes critical and almost impossible for this to work without it being a part of the equation. Since the microphone's on, Maureen Bush with the Bank of Tampa. Um, one of the questions and concerns that I have is when we talk about some of the alternative data is when we talk about the demographic group being younger, is what happens when we have roommate situations and one person's on the utility bill and not the other person and what kind of um, unintended consequences come of, come of that. So that's one of the concerns that I have. Aubrey Hewlings from the Farmers National Bank of Emlinton. Uh, many times we see when people get a mortgage, it's the first time they're coming to us you know, to get credit. So they may not have credit or they may have very, very limited credit. The problem that poses with alternative data, and I think Rick mentioned, um, what's the appetite of the regulators to accept this alternative data? And not only the regulators, but the secondary market. Because when you're looking at a mortgage, um, typically it's a 30-year mortgage, and that's where the secondary market comes into play. Um, because of the the interest rate risk um, in, in that um, in that area, so we need to understand the appetite and, and will that be accepted in that arena? More fundamentally, um, a lot of our membership and the and the people in our community that are unbanked aren't looking for a mortgage; they're looking for a used car loan to make it to their job. Therein lies, I think, our first issue. How do you get these people a used car loan? so that they have dependable transportation to the job they must have. And you've got to overcome that hurdle before you even start talking about mortgages. They're, they're lucky to pay their rent payments and the like in a college town, to be honest. So, I mean, for us, it's, you know, you're looking at affordability, you stop, you say, okay, this member, provided we make this loan, will be able to get this job and earn this much income. They will have these related expenses. It's very manual. You hope once you go through the process once that they will create a credit score that you can go with the next time because they've built some, no pun intended, credibility with us as a lender. So, I mean, honestly, it isn't about a house. It's about that car. Uh, this is Brian Bruns from Annandale, Minnesota. I'd like to go back just a bit to the couple of times it was said about the deposit data that we have and that we should be releasing some of that and make it portable. I think that I guess it would be remiss in saying that it, that's not a commodity to us. It, it, it sounds like you treat that data as though it's a commodity and it's not. There's We're talking about banking regulations as it relates to fair lending and as it relates to really lending at this point. But our industry just went through a huge change in beneficial ownership, which took a ton of training. Um, we actually tick off a few of our customers because we have to ask them penetrating questions that we've been doing business with people for 30 years. And now we have to ask them, who's the actual owner of this? And how many own over 25%? And they're looking at us like, what is, what is happening with that? So to go back to something, Jason, you had mentioned a five, eight, I think you said $8,000 to underwrite a mortgage. 
I don't know how you're calculating that, but if I took all of those costs that we have, because we all have startup costs, fixed costs, so if I want to sensationalize that and put a cost to our mortgage, I could wrap all of that stuff into it and make it sound. I mean, there's no way my bank survives with an $8,000 underwriting. There's, there's no way that happens. I don't know if you're including some of your research and development costs in that. Um, and I guess the point is I just want to make sure you understand that to us as an industry, and I know to our customers, they trust us with their data. And is it going to be easy for them to just push a button electronically and say, yes, give that access to somebody else? We all know they don't read the disclosures most of the time anyway. And by pushing it and making it very convenient, it's going to come back and bite us who is charged with protecting that data. So that's just another perspective. Brent Neiser, National Endowment for Financial Education. A couple of framing comments. Uh, the used car, you know, that's an asset, uh, really, because it uh, enables employment and cash flow. Forget about depreciation. It is, is valuable to that person as a home or, you know, a starter condo or something. And then I'm going to make another Sophie transition comment here. Uh, this this. I just love that phrasing, liability management, and that may eventually go to the consumer letter level, but for intermediaries, for the Bureau, that's a great way to think about some of this. Uh, it's empowering. I will, and she's taking this from asset management lessons, I will add another one, and this may not be possible until the future, and of course the future is already here, but it's not evenly distributed, um, and that's data privacy management. That's just another construct to think about of empowering people and then the financial education tools we provide to folks. You know, I'd, I'd like to comment just a little bit about Brian, you know, and I know this is a sensitive area, but, um, you know, it's not about the commoditization of the data. It's about the consumer's right to their own data. And so, you know, and the, you know, with, with Acorns and kind of how we work with kind of uh, funding accounts and DDAs and, and debit cards, there's actually really strong data that, like by linking that account to Acorns, actually the customer's loyalty increases to your institution because not only are we providing service to you, but also we're delivering a service that you're likely never going to offer. And so that actually is a really good way in which community banks, credit unions, and fintech can actually work together. Because the thing that we all have in common in this room is like we're very consumer oriented, which is a little bit different than the rest of the financial services industry. And so I think we should um, figure out how we can work together and figure out understanding that relationship and the mutual benefit of sharing the information with the, consumer, the customer actually being at the center of it, as opposed to us kind of building walls. I'd like to um, uh, draw an end to this uh, roundtable. Uh, we will begin the next roundtable in a moment, but first I'd like to welcome uh, Acting Director Mulvaney. Uh, he is here, and I know that he has some comments uh, for uh, to share with us. Thank you, Doctor. Um, and again, I apologize, y'all have, um, it's probably our fault because we set the schedule, uh, but y'all happen to be here during the last fiscal week of the year. So there's a couple things going on, notwithstanding the Senate hearing that's going on. So we've had to, have been running back and forth to my other job um, last couple of hours, and I apologize. And we'll be doing the same uh, when I'm finished here. Uh, I want to begin by thanking um, Dr. Johnson and um, Maureen and Rick uh, for agreeing to lead the, the, three, um, the, the three advisory boards. Um, I think you're already starting to get a sense for how much work this is going to be, but I, I also hope you're getting a chance to see what value it's going to have. Um, when we changed the boards earlier this year, um, we got accused, which is fine, I get accused of things all the time, of, uh, of gutting these boards and wanting to ignore them and to sort of cutting them out. And I hope you're starting to see um, that the exact opposite is true. We made the changes for a reason. And I think only Brent, Brent, you the only one who's, who stayed over? Should look around this room. I'm, I'm also <laughs> called Lazarus. <laughs> <laughs> um, each of the boards prior to the restructuring that we've undertaken was roughly this size, if not somewhat bigger. 
Okay. Um, and instead of getting a chance to sit, and I, think, I understand you all got together last night and, and had a chance to meet each other and talk a little bit, and you've spent some time today, and I've really enjoyed watching the back and forth. Instead of doing that, the structure was that um, you as one group would come in and talk to the Bureau, and we'd listen to you and ask questions and stuff, and then that group would leave. That say So the, consumers, the consumer advocates would come in first, say their piece, we'd write down notes, and then you'd leave. And then some time, a period of time later, the community bankers would come in and fill a room and they'd have their piece and we'd take down notes and we'd say what the other folks had said. And then the, again, later on, the, the credit unions would come in. Um, and it just strikes me, this is a lot more fruitful. This is a lot more productive, especially from a bureau's perspective, but I hope it is from yours as well. Um, I, I Listen, I, I know there's going to be places where y'all disagree and that's fine. Okay, That's the nature of life. But I hope you're also starting to get a sense that there's not only places where you're going to agree, but even on the places where you disagree, there's an opportunity here to draw some value. Because I know, I know Brian's sitting there going, you know, really, that's not my customer. And maybe it's not. Maybe the, the, the issue that, that, that Ron raises doesn't really speak to your customer base because you're from, you know, central Minnesota, and, and that's different than it is where I am, right? Um, but maybe at the same time, it helps you understand that your situation is not uniform. And that there are other places and other parts of the country who are dealing with issues that you aren't dealing with. So it maybe put, allows you to say, okay, they're not coming at to get me. They're not doing this. They're not taking this position to come and get me. They're doing this position. They're taking this position because somewhere, somewhere else outside of central Minnesota, this is a real issue. Um, and you get a chance to sort of get their perspective on things. And conversely, it, it works all the way around these, these tables. And I think, I hope that that is of value to, to you folks. I can assure you it's a value to us. And I want to point out, I don't know if you all have met Tom. Tom, Paul or not, Tom, if you'd raise your hand. Tom, and where's David? Is he around or not? He's, uh, he's good. He's on the road, which is exactly where he's supposed to be. Uh, David runs, uh, amongst other things, our, our regulatory operation along with a, a career staffer who's out on the road today. Um, and I'm so glad he's here to get a chance to, to listen to this because he's where the rubber meets the road when it comes to the regulatory environment. Um, and he gets a chance to see the back and forth, and that's extraordinarily valuable. I'm glad to hear that Dave's out on the road because that's the other... Um, the other thing I want to talk about very briefly, we mentioned it at lunch. Um, we made these groups smaller in order to allow us to do this, but also to allow us to spend more of our time getting out in the field. Um, I'd love to have folks here go into your institutions and do a loan closing. I'd love to have folks here come and meet some of the folks you folks are representing. I, that, that, that's... Uh, I, and I know I know some of them have done that. There's no question. But we are going to do a much better job of regulating if we understand the real world and get a chance to go out and actually walk in y'all's shoes for a day or two or whatever. Um, and that's one of the reasons, by the way, we picked fintech. Uh, I think for this first theme to sort of discuss because it really is. Um, if you stop to think about it, a blank sheet of paper or the closest that we're going to get to it in what we do um, here and what you folks do and what you do together because you're almost starting from scratch. Um, and it is a chance to sort of sit down and say, okay, um, uh, mortgages, we've been doing those for a long time and we've been fighting about mortgages for a long time, but let's, let's start from scratch and see if there's a way to um, do what the, the new guys want to do uh, and then also s figure out a way to accommodate what, what the established banking community wants to do and all at the same time protecting consumers. And while not only protecting consumers, um, figure out a way to make this product and service banking available to people who otherwise might not get it. I mentioned again that the credit deserts uh, forum we had last week uh, and how fintech could help solve that problem. In fact, when I, when one of the reasons we picked fintech was that when we go down what we're supposed to do at the Bureau, and I've talked about this publicly a lot, yes, we are supposed to, supposed to protect consumers. There's no question about that. But in the same section of the statute that says the reason the Bureau's, uh, Bureau is created in order to do X, Y, and Z and why on that list is protect consumers. We're also supposed to make sure that we're not over-regulating in an unduly burdensome way. We're also supposed to make sure that we make credit available to people. We're supposed to make sure we educate people about financial products. FinTech allows us to do all of that. Um, so the, the, the value that we draw as a bureau from these types of meetings can't, can't be, um, be overstated. So um, thank you for taking the time to do it. Thank you for taking the time to take it seriously. Um, and I hope that each of you walks out of here um, recognizing, if, if nothing else, one thing, which is that we're not just checking a box here. I'm not doing this because the statute says I have to do this twice a year. 
Right? We're doing this because we actually do want to get input from each one of these groups. And we want you to draw some, some benefit from that as well. Uh, but we do take this very seriously. Um, and while, again, my time here is probably shorter than, 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 um, than uh, otherwise it might be, uh, I'm, I'm absolutely positive you're going to see the benefits of this to the benefits to the benefits of consumers, to the benefits of the consumer, uh, the uh, community banks, and to the benefits of the credit unions um, in short order. Um, and this will be one of those times, because I know every single one of you is involved in your community in some way, shape, or form. And as I did, I used to walk out of those meetings and go, I wonder if that was a good use of my time, and that you will always know that this this was a good use of your time. So with that, um, I'll thank you, and uh, we're going to stay around for the beginning of the, the next conversation, but don't be surprised if I step out. So thank you again. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Acting Director. Uh, what we'd like to do uh, is to begin another thoughtful conversation, and that is focused on utilizing technology uh, to prevent the um, pre to prevent and respond to elder elder financial abuse. Uh, this is an important topic, and I'm happy to hear that the Acting Director has made this an issue uh, that is uh, key to the Bureau. I'm pleased to welcome the following subject matter experts from the Bureau, Stacy Kanan, Naomi Karp, and Albert Chang. And, um, and so we'll begin with, um, with, with Albert, and then we will move into the discussion after the framing that Albert does, as we see <laughs> Stacy and, uh, and, and Naomi are now of course, uh, joining us at the, at, the, at the round table. And so, Albert, would you like to kick us off? Uh, Mike is not working. I, I, I won't repeat uh, what I just said about the Office of Innovation. Just wanted to note that certainly uh, there are various uses of alternative data. One of the uh, takeaways from the request for information on alternative data is that alternative data can be used outside of uh, underwriting. Uh, it can be used at different uh, parts of the credit life cycle, not just uh, uh, underwriting. It can be used uh, in relation to different products. And you know, as it relates to alternative data use uh, outside of underwriting, it can be used uh, for uh, fraud prevention, for uh, identity verification. I think that is one of the areas in which uh, we have seen technology be used uh, effectively to uh, protect against uh, elder abuse. Um, but, but I'll let the experts here uh, discuss um, uh, their, their remarks here uh, on the sort of main topic. Sorry. As you can see, I'm not a techie. Um, <laughs> anyway, hello, everyone. I'm Stacy Cannon, and I lead the Office of Financial, of um, the Office for Older Americans here at the Bureau. And with me is my colleague, Naomi Karp, who's a senior policy analyst. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you to all the boards for inviting us, as well as our colleagues in external affairs. We really appreciate this opportunity. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with our office, uh, we are uh, we live in the cons uh, the uh, consumer education and engagement division. Uh, we do a mix of policy, educational, and research initiatives that are designed to help protect older consumers from unfair, deceptive, and abusive practices, as well as help them make sound financial decisions as they age. Um, since we opened our doors in 2011, uh, working to address the problem of elder financial exploitation has really been a very top priority um, for us. Naomi's going to kick off today's discussion, and um, in that she'll give a very uh, quick background, a little bit of uh, what elder financial exploitation is and the scope of the problem, as well as a brief overview of a couple of our policy initiatives in that space. 
Um, we hope that that will help to provide context for today's dis uh, discussion of uh, using technology to help prevent and respond to elder financial exploitation. Um, and Naomi's going to tell you about one of our key initiatives, and that was we, in 2016, we released an advisory with uh, voluntary recommendations for financial institutions on best practices for what they can do to help protect their older account holders and their members. Um, in preparing those recommendations, we met with many uh, financial institutions from the largest to the community banks and many credit unions as well as their trade associations, um, as well as many experts. Receiving that input was really invaluable to us. Um, and uh, I, you know, I, I have to tell you that we are a very small team and we're comprised mostly of lawyers and policy analysts. We're not techies, as you could see by the difficulty I had in turning on my microphone, um, which is one of the reasons why we are particularly happy to have this opportunity today to hear your thoughts and get your reactions to some of the work that we're doing. Um, it's, it, you know, even though we released the advisory with recommendations in 2016, we continue to meet with financial institutions to think about ways that um, we can work together to help protect um, older Americans. Um, and before I turn it over to Naomi, I. I'm not going to take long, but I would be remiss if I don't give a shameless plug for some of our consumer-facing um, products and resources that we created to also help people protect themselves and help service providers and families protect older consumers from frauds and scams and elder financial exploitation. I would invite you to please check out um, consumerfinance.gov search older Americans and you'll find our landing page uh, money smart for older adults it's a training curriculum we created with the FDIC for helping um, older adults as well as their families and service providers spot and prevent uh, frauds and scams managing someone else's money is designed for financial caregivers who are handling the finances of a loved one or a friend who's incapacitated. Um, and with that, I'll um, end it there for the sake of time. I could go on. I, I would also invite anyone who's interested in learning more about our other materials to please reach out. We're happy to do a call or a webinar or anything like that. So with that, I'll turn it over to Naomi. Thanks, Stacy, and thanks for having me. Um, Naomi Karp, Senior Policy Analyst on the team. Um, I will try to be relatively brief because I know you'll probably have a lot to say and a lot to teach us. I'm just going to say at the outset, I've been working on law, aging, policy, and financial exploitation issues for um, more years than I want to admit, but maybe 30, and so I'm very passionate about it. But I will try to be quick and I'm going to try to do three things. Give you some quick background on older adults, their banking habits and elder financial exploitation. Tell you quickly about the policy initiatives that Stacy mentioned. And then because we do want to talk about um, technology and innovation here, I'm going to give you a few examples that I'm aware of. These are mostly in the non-banking sphere, but of some startups and some um, applications of technology to help protect older adults from financial exploitation and keep them financially sound, and maybe that will help kick off your conversation. So just going um, quickly, I'm not going to hit on everything in the slides. This one, and you may have read these, tells you just how large and what a large share of our population older adults are, and that's growing. You hear the stats, so I'm not going to repeat them. Um, the second bullet is really to tell you older adults have a lot of money, you know, collectively over $17 trillion. So um, that's where the money is, and that's why people go after that money, and that's really unfortunate. So older adults are banked. That's important to know. Also cognitive status. Um, and you'll, when we get to the technology applications, you'll see the role of declining cognition. That's really key. A lot of older adults have declining cognition. The research teaches us that one of the first types of capacity to go 
as people become cognitively impaired is their ability to handle finances. So that can be happening even before even close family members are realizing that there's some cognitive decline going on. And that's when people are also losing the judgment to detect whether something is a scam or a fraud, um, making them particularly vulnerable. Um, again, in terms of banking habits, older adults are most likely to rely on tellers more than other groups. And they're also probably less likely to do online banking or mobile banking, although that's changing. But especially when you get up into the older old, that's certainly true. Um, just to level set for us in terms of what is elder financial exploitation, what do we mean by that? A very simple definition is the illegal or improper use of an older adult's funds, property, or assets. Um, all kinds of perpetrators from the grandson in the basement to the offshore scammers. Um, it's the most common form of elder abuse, um, and we know why people are vulnerable, many different reasons. Um, we have a variety of estimates of prevalence, anywhere from 5 to 20 percent. We know that older adults lose a lot of money every year, but that th these crimes are still under the radar. One study showed that only one out of 44 cases come to the attention of people who can actually help the victim. So it's a big problem. Um, so Stacy mentioned the policy initiatives, and I'll mention briefly one going back to 2013. We started working on this as soon as the Bureau opened. Um, we heard from a lot of financial institutions that they were afraid to report when they saw these things happening to their customers or members. And that was because of privacy rules. And we took the lead, but along with seven other financial regulators, we wanted to tell them, no, it's OK. You can go to the authorities. You can go to law enforcement. You can go to adult protective services because of many exceptions to the Gramm-Leach-Bliley notice and opt-out provisions. Um, so we got that out in 2013. Um, secondly, Stacy mentioned the advisory and recommendation. I'm going to come back to that in a second. And thirdly, I'm not going to go into detail, but just last year, um, along with Treasury and Treasury's um, FinCEN, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, together we put out a joint memo on how financial institutions, law enforcement, social services, and others can collaborate to fight this problem. Um, so coming back to the 2016 recommendations, again, I'm not going to go through all the points on these slides. You have the DACs. I'm just going to hit a few points. Um, training is very important. Um, and actually, we in the bank reform legislation that passed this year, there's some incentives to financial institutions to offer training. So that's kind of a newsworthy item again. Um, technology, since we're talking about technology, I will mention that we emphasize in our voluntary recommendations that um, we know that banks and credit unions, other financial services providers, have fraud detection software. They have their BSA compliance software. But there are particular things, particular red flags, um, that may be different for elder financial exploitation than for other types of fraud. And it's very important for institutions to kind of adapt their systems to recognize those red flags where they have the resources. We certainly encourage the use of um, predictive analytics to be looking at each individual depositor and seeing what might be out of pattern for them and adding to that some of the things that might be particular to older adults. I always like to give the example, um, if a 20-year-old goes to an ATM machine at 3 o'clock in the morning, that is not going to look weird. If you know that your customer is an 85-year-old lady who lives in assisted living, that is very weird. So that should be a red flag. So things like that. Um, Okay, I'm going to skip over reporting. We talked about that already. Um, 
We did recommend that financial institutions offer other age-friendly services. Some of these can be opt-in account features, like um, alert, and these would be voluntary, but offering them the ability to set alerts for um, a transaction that might go over a certain limit, other specified account activity, something that's out of the geographic area, um, helping people make use of those um, options that are available and educating customers about those kinds of things. And then collaboration among the different stakeholders. So finally, I just want to run through, um, as I mentioned before, some new technology applications and that might trigger some conversation. And again, as I said, this is mainly non-bank technology, but um, my understanding is that banks are contracting with some of these non-bank providers to provide services. So I'm just going to run through a few of them. Again, we are not endorsing these particular ones. They're just examples. Um, so the first one is a company that offers monitoring the finances of older adults for fraud, ID theft, and also for those diminished capacity issues. There's a company called Eversafe. What they do is they use machine learning to analyze financial accounts, credit cards, and credit report data daily. So it's across accounts and across institutions. Obviously, this is something you sign up for. You give access to these accounts to the company. Um, the company identifies patterns and irregularities, such as changes in spending, use of new cards, opening of new accounts, missing deposits, late payments, and things like that. When they see those, they send suspicious activity alerts to their members via email, text, voice, or their own app. And the older adult who signs up for this can designate a family member or someone else as what they call trusted advocates. So these people also receive the alerts and they serve as an extra set of eyes in monitoring. So that's ever safe. Then we have a couple of um, prepaid or debit cards that are marketed to caregivers or family members that have particular protective features. Um, so one of them is called TrueLink. It's a prepaid Visa card. They say it provides independence to loved ones while providing additional financial protection. So for example, you could customize where the card works. You could manage cash withdrawals and you can receive real-time alerts. You can also give a card to a paid caregiver, so then um, the family member or the older adult can have more visibility into how the caregiver is making purchases, and so they're not misappropriating the funds. There's another one called the Amazing Care Network Care Card, which is a debit card that has similar features to the TrueLink. Um, then we have something called Honest spelled O-N-I-S-T. Um, it is a tool for sharing account information and documents among family members. So one of the issues is often the children or other family members are not aware even of where the parents have account, where their money is, how it's being spent. This could be a way to see the family finances all in one place, store important documents in a secure vault, and share the information with family members and professional contacts. And then finally, we have something called Silver Bills, which is a bill paying service for seniors. Um, what they do is you sign up for the service, it converts your bills into e-bills, they make the payments, the client receives monthly statements showing how the bills have been paid. On their website, they quote a client as saying, I feel like you are my eyes and ears. Um, they also say they reduce burden on long distance and other family members. So this could be um, a service that someone who has full capacity but maybe has physical disabilities or other restrictions might want to use, or it might be someone with declining capacity and a family member could help them get this service. So those are just a few examples, and um, with that I will leave it to you all.
Okay. Um, the bureau, the bureau would like for us to uh, discuss the following questions. And of course, as we've done in the past, uh, we actually in the discussion we wind up touching on all of the issues. And so to kick it off, uh, the first question is: Why are older Americans, in particular, vulnerable to financial exploitation? And will this problem get better or worse over time? This is Heidi Sexton with Sound Community Bank. We're a seven hundred million dollar uh, financial institution, community bank located in Seattle. I did forty three SARS last year as a seven hundred million dollar bank, and over half of them for, were for elder abuse. I do think the aging population. I do think the problem will uh, get worse as we go. I think we um, pointed on a, a couple of things of research items that the bureau did discuss. Um, but what I'm seeing is the romance scams continuing to increase due to the loneliness of this population, as well as family. So a lot of those resources that you uh, touched upon were family oriented, and I think many times the family, unfortunately, um, is is actually the criminal um, in in this case. We reach out to social services, we reach out to law enforcement, reach out to anybody that we can. Those resources are significantly overwhelmed with this problem. Um, many times they just, um, they, they can't handle the workload. So I just wanted to give that feedback, uh, knowing that we're a small organization. Uh, about half of our branches are located in a demographic uh, where, where we do have a, a, an older population. So thank you. Sammy O'Malley from Scratch. I just want to start by saying that whatever solution or service you design, it can't put the active onus on the elderly person. This is actually a case, given cognition is a factor, that the solution has to not be cognitively loading or cognitively taxing. You effectively have to create a, call it guardian angel, that can actually kind of on behalf of that kind of elderly person take social. It's rare that I say this, but this is actually a case where machine learning can help. Uh, you know, an anomaly detection, you know, uh, Naomi talked about, you know, the red flags, you know, the ABA actually has a pretty good list of red flags, whether it's, you know, sudden kind of, or bigger uh, transfers, uh, more frequency of activity, uh, signing up for services that you are more complicated than you normally would in need, or uh, withdrawing of accounts or transfers without any kind of consideration to the penalties. There's all these kind of anomalies that you detect, and I just gave a few kind of more uh, baseline. But what, real, what machine learning can do is actually these models can get trained not only to that particular elderly consumer, but similar elderly folks that meet kind of that profile. And it, it only gets better and better over time uh, because unfortunately this is, and because I do agree with you, Heidi, the problems only get, get worse. And actually technology is going to play a role in trying to scam those folks. And this is a case where technology has to come back technology and to keep up with the other side that's going to keep evolving kind of uh, their methods. Uh, there's a real just question on who is the interested party that's going to try to fund and build this and ultimately kind of pay for it uh, and who's capable of doing it. And, and Brian, honestly, it's not to bring it back to data access. The the banks in this case are, uh, to your point, quite uniquely uh, able to do this because they have access to all that data that you need to train the model. And so it, either the banks have to do it or the folks that they are being banked with, because you guys mentioned they're all actually quite banked, or that data needs to be more readily available to the ecosystem so other entities can actually train those models and combat those folks. Loud. Oh, there we go. Um, we actually do utilize our anti-money laundering system, and um, of those SARS that I mentioned that were filed, most of them were detected through that system. The problem that I have is convincing the elder that they are being scammed. And they will yell, they will close their account, I will refuse to wire, they will threaten me. Um, and so I need more tools, um, you know, when, when we're presented with a clearly a scam check or what we think is probably a scam check, I am held under Reg CC. I get a violation if I hold that check longer than I should. I need tools that kind of opt me out of this regulatory environment so I can prevent the consumer harm. So. 
And this is Maureen Bush of the Bank of Tampa, and I echo um, Heidi's comments that I think the most of at least the community banks have outsourced providers for BSA monitoring. And they have been responsive to provide modules that do focus on accounts of older Americans, and they're flexible that we can change our um, criteria and things like that. So I think that's been really good and very helpful. And I think, though, the technology is wonderful, but I think, as you stated, too, we do a lot of training on it as well, and the eyes and years of our frontline personnel, you know, we, we really need both in this case is hitting on all cylinders, but we do run into the issue as well, where someone, we're, we're trying to help them, but they do not want to, I guess, accept it, if you will, um, and it, it does become a little challenging at that point. So, um, Coastal Federal, $3 billion, Raleigh, North Carolina, we have seen probably in the last two years a big rise in, in elder fraud or elder exploitation. Um, the thing, I agree with the predictive tools, behavioral tools. The issue with those is they are, they are prohibitively expensive. Um, we are looking and doing a request for proposal right now for an AML tool, anti-money laundering and fraud tool, that will encompass um, being able to spot those faster. Um, some of our challenges are a lot of people with a vigorous online banking profile, a lot of people are moving away from brick and mortar. So even though we train our staff to look for clues when members come in, um, sometimes these things are happening at home with caregivers. We'll see situations where a caregiver will actually open an account um, at the credit union, and then you'll start seeing money being transferred via online banking from that elder member's account into the caregiver's account. Or um, we'll see a 90-year-old buy a Corvette, um, things like that. So, it, And there's a sad component of it, too, when we catch it and we try to speak to the member. I remember one of these conversations was... Um, I know, but she's the only person that visits me. So a lot of times you try to um, contact their, their children or um, other relatives. Sometimes you can't really discuss um, the case because they're not on the account or um, something else. But this is something that we've seen, and I, can't, I don't have my SAR count um, for over the last two years, but rapid uptick in, in that type of... Um, fraud as well. National Endowment for Financial Education. Uh, a lower cost method of some techniques could be borrowed from the gambling industry. So, Rick, I'm looking to you. But we, we have worked with the National Council on Problem Gambling, and actually that community, working with industry, has a program of self-exclusion from casinos where players with these, these uh, addictive problems will basically declare don't advance me so much money. Uh, they'll be they'll either like don't let me in to to use the the casino for six months or impose limits. There are also site blocking tools for online. Think about some of those techniques applied to the elder elder situation of people maybe with a family member can throw in some friction into their system online and also limit types of transactions that they pre commit to. This is a good example, I think, of um, <clears throat> why the Bureau should be very cautious and judicious about how uh, they allow data portability and data open data access um, as far as elder financial abuse because um, while we can protect, again, our data, um, somebody who's trying to take advantage of an elder may um, cause them to release certain data that can be used against a credit union or, or a community bank uh, through social engineering techniques or, or other ways to commit fraud and, and get the money out of the credit union or community bank um, as well. So being, you know, uh, I guess considerate about how uh, the agency, if they decide to, uh, to rule on data portability and access, uh, just this is a great example of why that, that is an a, a important issue to us. Um. Jeannie Stahl, again, MetaBank, Sioux Falls, South Dakota. We, because of we're in the G, our, uh, prepaid card market, we have millions of cards in the marketplace. This is an area of risk for us. But I would just say the more we can share with each other around the scams we're seeing, the scams um, 
change, they kind of mutate over time, whether they're asking folks to go buy gift cards, which we're seeing, or they're asking people to send money through uh, Western Union. Or uh, So that is another area the Bureau can help us, is as scams come up, to, to circulate that information more readily, just so we as bankers know what kinds of patterns to look for. I don't know if we even need machine, machine learning. Again, that would be great. Uh, but to the extent we know there's scams out there, we can easily program our software just to look for the purchase of a gift card you know, like you said, outside of hours or whatever it is. But uh, so that that would be helpful. You know, there are similar technology examples in uh, credit card transaction fraud, right? So, you know, some of the most sophisticated tools have been developed when the banks uh, hold the liability at the end of the day. Um, that's where a lot of the sort of investment goes first and foremost. And, you know, there are examples of data consortiums, for instance, where large credit card issuers um, sort of share information in a digital format about fraud schemes um, that allows them to react very quickly to identify something that may be hitting multiple banks or multiple issuers at the same time. You can imagine kind of similar tools for this specific um, uh, type of abuse where um, we're able, you know, the first step, of course, is just making everyone aware of a specific scam. But, you know, the way that uh, oftentimes fraud works, by the time you can write it up and understand what's happened, it's already too late. Um, so I think you know you really have to think about ways to actually share the data that's coming in, um, so that we can kind of use uh, uh, sort of machine readable technologies to be faster in our ability to react. So I just want to touch on what Jason said there because we've got some facts, right? We know Americans are living longer. Uh, due to technology, public health, medicine, uh, we know they trust more. And, uh, you know, technology can certainly help us identify some of these things, but we need that human touch. We need the people to be able to see that on the ground. But more importantly, it's the timing. So whether you're filing a SAR, whether you're reporting that, uh, I'm not sure how much more the, the Bureau can do. I think sharing some of the scams is great, but the time from identification to action is so long. I mean, SARS don't get acted on immediately. You report it to agencies, that doesn't get acted on. And by the time it does, it's too late. So I'm not sure how much more the Bureau could do to impact that. Uh, it strikes me that it may be often too late um, if you are trying to address the problem by the time an individual is isolated from help it has a cognitive impairment. Um, there are a lot of factors that need to be changed. Obviously, we need to address uh, people who are living completely isolated from anyone who can provide care or act on their behalf. Um, but there's another piece to this, which is there's a unintended consequence of the architecture of our current financial system that many people, though most Americans live with their finances integrated with their family in very substantive ways. Most people do not experience the uh, management of their financial relationships in their individual accounts as something that they can easily collaborate on with the people in their life who care about them and who can share information and help them make decisions. Part of that has been exacerbated by technology um, and by uh, financial services technology infrastructure that is largely focused on uh, a sort of stylized view of an individual alone in a vacuum making all their decisions on their own. We don't have a generalized legal framework to support uh, the delegation of rights to view information, to monitor, as well as the delegation of rights to uh, act on a person's behalf that is modern. We have the hi long history of powers of attorney uh, relationships, but those haven't really been embodied in useful tools that people integrate in their day-to-day -day financial life. Um, nor do we have the uh, technology infrastructure to establish a system of trusted identities and relationships between people uh, who have rights and responsibilities for each other with respect to their financial accounts and relationships. And I think that if we 
push the overall sector to a world that recognizes the reality of the interconnectedness of people with their family members and, and other close loved ones, um, we will see the problem slowly improve over time as people uh, come, to, come to adopt that as a habit before there's a problem. Could I just respond to that quickly? So I think some of the recommendations we made are are geared towards overcoming some of those barriers. So encouraging financial institutions to offer things like view only access to accounts by a third party. Obviously, it's going to have to be with the consent of either the older person or their fiduciary. Um, but we have so many barriers in our system, just privacy laws alone are a big one. And, you know, of course, we're huge proponents of privacy, but it's almost like we have to um, jury rig or come up with some Rube Goldberg solutions here because of, as you said, our legal structure, our family structure. So it's almost like we need to figure out ways to go back to a time where there was more sharing of that. Um, but also recognizing that there are risks there too. I mean, power of attorney abuse is a huge problem. Guardianship abuse is a huge problem. So it's a problem in whatever way. So we have to try to be smart about which ones of those we're choosing. And uh, I just want to also say that we have always recognized that while there is a very important role for financial institutions in this space to help protect older people, um, it's it, they are not exclusively the solution. And that we do work with our counterparts across the federal government um, on those some of the various other issues that were raised. I, I do think, to go back to one of Heidi's points earlier, um, I, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that there are a growing number of elderly abuse cases that are family related. And they, they may not even know that they're upset with each other, siblings all of a sudden realize, well, wait a minute, you've been taking care of mom or dad for, you know, two or three years, but where'd all the money go? Because they don't understand it. And then all of a sudden there's these privacy issues that we're dealing with. And it's customers that we know. We, we know that there is, you know, a little bit of rift in the family. And so nobody really is the power of attorney. So how do we try and settle those things because they're looking to us as their financial experts. They've had their accounts with us for years. And so some of that technology doesn't really see it that way. Um, and, and I get that there's a much bigger world out there, but it, it, it is a difficult situation. Uh, I want to echo uh, Brian's point. And, and first off, I want to applaud the Bureau for uh, focusing on this issue uh, with a mother who's squarely in this uh, demographic. Uh, it, it's close to home. Uh, and, and the real issue is, is a, a, an issue today is the financial institution is sitting in this role, as Sammy said, like, who's playing guardian angel? So what do you do when, when an elderly client comes in and says, I want to add my new young friend to my account? Uh, what do you do? Uh, I, I don't have the answer to that. Uh, today, you know, we, we have to make a judgment call, and, and either the client doesn't like it or... or uh, we're, the financial institution is put in a really difficult spot, and, and I would look to this group to come up with uh, potential <coughs> solutions for that issue because today it, it, it is uh, not a, a good situation. Have you, uh, the banks and credit unions in this room, uh, had success in partnering with community based institutions and churches, mosques, synagogues in your community where there may be people who are willing to act, um, who have a relationship and uh, can provide some of the um, support to actually sh uh, share the information with the person in a way that's likely to be heard, uh, for one, and potentially act as an ongoing support over time. I would say globally from a community-based organization, we um, provide them with education and, and, and tools, but we run into the privacy issue. So I can't go to uh, my client's church and say, oh, you sat next to Rosie last week and could you, you know, I think something's going on there. Clearly, we, we can't do that. Clearly, we are partnering with community-based organizations. I sit on the Financial Beginnings uh, Board. We provide a lot of uh, education to our clients um, and to the community, but that's about um, as much as far as we can push it. I think, uh, oh, Brian Price at IU Credit Union. Um, we've had no success, to be candid. 
Uh, we've worked with Adult Protective Services. There has been one member that we filed reports nine times. I don't think they've ever been contacted. Law enforcement's overwhelmed with opiate issues and other things. To be totally honest, that goes to the top of the list. So really in terms of a law enforcement response, there, there really isn't one. And child, you know, child Protective Services is buried, Adult Protective Services is buried, all those social uh, sort of safety nets uh, can't address this issue. And, you know, we talk to other financial institutions more generally about issues and frauds and the like, but certainly we can't disclose any personal information. Uh, Samuel and Mallory Scratch. Uh, I'm left kind of thinking about Ron's point earlier around trust, uh, and this is a case where I think trust really matters. I'm left questioning why this individual has gone to a point where they don't trust the organization that's supposed to be protecting their finances. Uh, and I can completely understand it's probably very difficult, com you know, having equal trust, and maybe especially when it's a family member. But maybe what can we all collectively do to kind of increase their trust in, before it ever gets to this case? I think in, in these situations, it's a very emotional issue. You know, it's the scam of my grandson is held someplace, I have to send this, and so we try and stop them on that. They've been doing business with us forever. And now we say, you know, did you try and call your grandson? Well, why would I do that? Did you talk to your daughter or your son to see where they are? They're, and as soon as we start asking those questions, on their mind it is, they are um, emotionally charged to help their grandson to get it taken care of. They want it done fast. They don't want us asking them questions. And so, I don't know how you explain during the crisis that you should trust me, I am giving you good advice, when they don't want to hear it right then. So, and it is, you're right, we've said it before, but I've had customers close their account. They've said, then I'm leaving. Give me my account, give me my money, and they've gone for doing that. And I think you mentioned the, you know, trying to position to help before there is a problem. And I think one of the challenges with it is these are adults. You know, they're, they're independent. They want to hang on to their independence. And that makes it very difficult that, you know, we can't say at a certain age this has to happen because there's lots of people who do not have any impairment. And I think that's a huge struggle with it is because, you know, they, they're really looking to maintain that independence. So it's definitely a balancing act. Uh, Teresa Campbell, San Diego County Credit Union. I think we even see the scams affecting younger people. And um, unfortunately, we have a, one instance where it was an employee working in a financial institution knows better. But they don't want to believe it. So for the elderly, when it gets emotional and it's family, you have the same challenges. I think we need more predictive analytics to be able to head it off. And certainly more consumer education would help before they get to that point. And, and Sammy, to the point of trust, it unfortunately is frequently the person they trust the most, who's the person who's defrauding them. With this being a, an individual driven situation, you know, where the banks would be more than happy to try to up the guidance on it. I mean, I've got an 88 year old father that we just finally last week broke down and forced him to sign a POA because he's 88 and he's some days he's home and some days he's not home, you know? Um, so I can personally understand what's going on, but until, and, and maybe this is where the CFPB can step in and until there's a, a regulation that is going to provide or to shield financial institutions from liability, that, you know, if we're dealing, if there is a caveat for a potential elder exploitation case, you know, because if, if you've got, I got a friend that's 62 that's got the beginning stages of Alzheimer. So you can't say it, it starts at 80 or 75 or 70. But if there was a caveat in the, in the protection laws that said, Bank, if you feel that there is a potential exploitation going on, you can provide information. That would help open the door. But it's got to be a regulatory change or we're going to get sued for privacy issues. 
I mean, that's everybody. So if the CFPB, and I don't know where it falls in your jurisdiction to promulgate something like that, or it can be. I'm going to throw in uh, a quick, unless, uh, Stacy, you want to answer that? Yeah, so um, I just wanted to flag for you that in the most recent, what we frequently call here the this uh, omnibus banking law, there was a provision that was included that specifically uh, provides immunity from liability for, finan for covered financial institutions for reporting suspected elder financial exploitation to appropriate authorities, meaning law enforcement and adult protective services. The caveat is that the financial institution has to uh, train its uh, employees across the enterprise um, for being able to detect and respond to elder financial exploitation. So um, I think that there is recognition that um, that some financial institutions have been wary about reporting, but in fact, um, I think that the, that goes a long way to providing a safe harbor for financial institutions. That's that's good for the the police or, or the, the eight for those agencies, but if it's the younger lady in her 50s that's taking care of dad at 88 and taking advantage of dad, it's going to be a lot easier if we, could, if we can call in one of the children and say, hey, we need to sit down and talk. We have this belief that your father's being taken advantage of or your mother's being taken advantage of because of that trust. If we just run to the police, we're going to blow the whole thing. Um, just a quick response to that. It's not a regulatory thing, but um, g again, going back to the R2016 um, recommendations, one of the things that we're encouraging that I don't think is happening out there is that um, at various points at account opening or later, you know, when your clients are, or your customers or members are getting older, you could actually create a form so that you could get advanced consent from your account holder that, you know, if you think that I'm a victim or if you think that I'm starting to act weird and my capacity might be diminished, I'm giving you con consent in advance that you can talk to this designated person under these circumstances, my son, my daughter, whomever. Um, that will work under Graham Leach Bliley because consent of the consumer is an exception to the notice and opt out. So we are trying to be creative about ways that you can do that because we have been hearing um, for, you know, six, seven years from you guys and your counterparts that, hey, we report to Adult Protective Services, we import, report to law enforcement as the gentleman at the end of the table and we hear that a lot. They're overwhelmed, they're doing the drug cases, they're doing violent crime, they can't do this. But we know our customers, we know their family, we want to talk to the family member. And so, you know, we've worked to develop ways to do that. And I guess I would like to encourage financial institutions to actually try to um, implement those because, you know, we think that they would pass muster and it's at least worth a try. <laughs> Um, we don't now, but it's certainly something we can discuss, and we I mean, have it talked about it. It would be nice to have illustrative language from the, from the Bureau, and we could... It would be really nice if we could get some kind of illustrative language from the Bureau so that, you know, we, we have a uniform case in all institutions. Is that something that's possible? Okay. Thank you. Uh, before we uh, end this roundtable, I know that Brent had uh, one more point to make, and then uh, we will sum up, because I know folks have to catch flights, and, um, and this has been really a wonderful um, day all together uh, for us to just really sit back and really think about the discussion. What, um, Brent? Thanks. This is actually five mini data points from research we funded with the University of Alabama. These are early warning signs of impaired financial skills has nothing to do with Alzheimer's. 
one, taking longer to complete financial tasks, two, missing key details in financial documents, three, experiencing difficulty with everyday math, four, showing decreased understanding of financial concepts, and five, identifying risk and investment opportunities. We actually have videos on our website that illustrate each of these. You know, this is, as we've talked at the get-go and through the course of this conversation, it, 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 it's a critical issue. It's a, it's a conversation that is relevant to all of us, more so than most other topics, because each of us is impacted in a very personal way, in a, in a business way, in a social way. Uh, there probably is almost no other single issue that, that impacts us either with friends and family or, for that matter, hopefully uh, not, but probably for many of us on our, in our own right as we age. Um, which is exactly why the Bureau has taken this on and, and made it a higher priority. Uh, and so one of the things uh, you know, that our Office of Elder Americans has been supporting actively are these community networks. And we spent, we spent some time the last few months, uh, Director Mulvaney went out with uh, Attorney General Schmidt in Kansas, and we kicked off a town hall on this topic. Uh, did a series of community events around it. Since then, uh, senior staff as well as the office have gone out and worked in several states, put together uh, roundtables with attorneys generals and with local law enforcement. And so I'm only raising this to mention that we're going to be having another town hall coming up on October 18th in Baton Rouge, Louisiana with Attorney General Landry. Um, and for those who have interest in this topic, you know, we'd love to keep the conversation going separately. And if there are things you'd like to do in your own communities, let us know. And, you know, your idea of, you know, coming up with uniform form, happy to look at that. I think it's a good idea. But we want to also bring what we can offer to your own communities to help, you know, bring attention to the issue at that level and work with the other financial institutions and consumer groups out there to ensure that everyone has what they need. So I will end it there, but I would encourage you to either live stream that town hall in October, or if you have any interest in attending or know folks, we'd love to have your help with turnout. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank Acting Director Mulvaney, Anthony Welcher, uh, and all of the Bureau staff uh, and the advisory committee members for today's discussion. Uh, we have learned a lot today, absolutely. It's just been a wonderful, wonderful occasion to just, uh, uh, for anyone who's even intellectually curious about these issues. I'm looking forward to um, building on our work uh, with the Bureau and helping to play a role in its mission to serve and protect consumers. I want to thank the advisory committee members for, for providing uh, valuable feedback and insight today. And uh, I can now say that this meeting is adjourned. And have a wonderful afternoon. And uh, of course, travel safely uh, back across the country from whence all of us have come. Thank you. <laughs>